Jubilee, I believe we're live. Well, good evening, everyone. I am Jubilee McGill. I am a parent of public school children. I am pu a public school supporter, a former candidate for Addison 5 um, House District, and I am a social justice advocate. Tonight, we show up in solidarity with public school personnel, both educators and staff, and our state employees, because we will not entertain cuts to these workers' pensions. We are joined tonight by Paul Sillo, President and Executive Director of the Public Assets Institute. He will speak with us about the negative impact of pension structure changes on pension members who are majority women and how this issue lies at the intersection of education, economic, and gender justice. We are also joined by parent leaders to talk about why it's important to support public school personnel, and we will share some action steps that you can take tonight. With that, let's welcome Paul Sillo, President and Executive Director of the Public Assets Institute. Thank you, Jubilee. And uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, let's see. Hey. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, hello, and uh, thank you to uh, Rad for inviting me to talk with you this evening. It's nice to be here. And thank you for your support of public workers who are essential to our well being and the well being of the state. Our, and congratulations on your success in getting the legislative leaders to drop the proposed pension legislation and agree to set up a commission to think through this issue over the summer. Uh, I want to say a little bit about Public Assets Institute for those that don't know about us. Uh, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit with offices in Montpelier that have been empty for the past year. Um, we analyze Vermont tax budget and economic policy from the perspective of everyday Vermonters. And you can freely access all of our work on our website at publicassets.org. <coughs> we um, won a couple of notes about our work. We publish our annual State of Working Vermont report in December each year pulling together data on Vermont workforce, employment, income, cost of basic needs, and other key indicators of residents' economic well-being. And our 2020 report includes a summary of all of the 2020 federal relief aid to Vermont, the COVID relief aid, and excerpts from interviews with a range of Vermonters who talk about their lives during the first six months of the pandemic. And you can find that report on our website at publicassets.org. So I'm here to talk with you tonight about public pensions, but I wanna let you know that I'm nowhere near an expert on pensions, which is a complicated area of finance. Uh, if, anybody of you, as, if anybody of you has been working on this issue, I think you know fairly quickly if you start asking questions, it's, it gets complicated very fast. Uh, public assets has not done work on public pensions until recently, mainly because we have thought of pensions as a labor negotiation issue between employer and, empl <clears throat> and employees, which we rarely get involved in. We've been digging into this issue over the last couple of years, however, since the pension debate has a signi significant impact on the state budget. And uh, we, but we have not published in anything on pensions yet, and we ex although we expect to. And I'll do my best to explain this to the extent of what we know so far, or explain, you know, speak from what I know, essentially. So I'd like to talk about three things. First, why pensions for our public employees are important to everyone in Vermont. The second, why we're discussing a problem with public employee pensions now. And third, what we can do about it. So first, um, the importance of public employee pensions. I was leafing through a 2005 report today. It's a report of the commission on funding the state teachers retirement system that was issued in November, 2005. And I found this statement, I, don't worry, I'm not gonna like read you the report or anything. I, I, but I found this statement that I think says better than I could ever say it, why this is important to all of us. The commission said, uh, this is the quote, the commission believes that teachers are the foundation of our education system. 
a resource integral to the long-term viability of the Vermont economy. Retirement security is an important piece of the employment package as individuals make life decisions about their careers. Without a competitive retirement plan, schools will not be able to compete for high quality teachers. Now, granted that's a sort of looking at it from an economic standpoint and an employer employee standpoint and not from a individual well-being standpoint, but I think it's an important part of the public discussion. And the same could be said of state employees. Pensions are part of a public employee's comp compensation and an increase in employee contributions or cuts in their benefits is a cut to their compensation. Cutting em public employees compensation makes it more difficult for the public sector to attract and keep talent to serve us at, at the health department, the Department of Public Service, the Agency of Education, all the other state agencies and in public schools across the state. So we, if we want a vibrant public sector, we need to make sure that we have that, uh, that the compensation package is, uh, is attractive to bring talent into the system. The other part of the reasons that of the reason that pensions are important is that they can provide in combination with social security benefits, a livable income for public employees after they retire. Without sufficient retirement income, individuals risk falling into poverty in old age, requiring additional state support for basics like food, healthcare, and housing. So public employee pensions are an important part of the well-being of our elders. So what's the What's the problem now? As I said, the finances of pensions are complicated, but they boil down to this. Employee and employee, employer and employee contributions plus returns on invested funds provide the money for benefits to retired public employees and pay the administrative fees to manage the pension funds. So essentially money in employer and employee contributions plus return on investment equals money out, which is the benefits paid to public employee, employees and the administrative fees that to manage the funds. That's the basic formula. But there are five things that have happened that upset this basic equation. One is the, related to the employer contribution. For now the employer is, is the state in this case because um, even technically the teacher, the employer, the state is not the employer of the teachers, but uh, was obligated under the, is obligated under the uh, pension system to make a, a state contribution. For about 15 years in the 1990s and early 2000s, the state didn't pay into the teacher's retirement fund the amount the actuaries recommended. And the actuaries are the financial guys or people that uh, basically tell the state how much you have to put in to sort of keep the fund uh, on target, balanced. This happened mostly during the Dean and Douglas administrations. The shorted amount was about $170 million, but the impact of that failure to pay into the fund is much larger than $170 million because that amount has, because that amount has not been in the fund to be invested in grow, and grow, essentially it's multiples of that amount that are actually, uh, that actually impact the fund. I don't know what that number is, but it's, we know that it's much more than $170 million. Like I said, multiples. So one, one is the employer contribution and the 15 years of, of underfunding. The second is investment returns. The pension fund returns have been lower than what was assumed by the pension boards and by the actuaries. And that, again, remember the, the uh, contribution employee-employee contributions and the, and the uh, investment returns are what bring the money into the fund. So having lower returns created unfunded liabilities in the fund. That's part of the problem. Um, employees. Employees have made their contributions as they were obligated to do. But as the number of students has gone down over the past two decades, the number of teachers has as well. And that means fewer active employees pay into the system. So demographics has been working against 
the financial vitality of the teacher's retirement system. Uh, pensioners, I don't think this is a big point, but I think it's, it's a point. It's uh, sort of from a financial standpoint, at least moving in the wrong direction, which is that people are living longer. Now that's a good thing from the standpoint of health and well-being, but from the standpoint of a financially viable system, it means payouts <clears throat> to people receiving pensions are required for a longer period than was assumed decades ago when the fund was created. So that creates pressure on the fund. And finally, uh, healthcare. There's a final twist to this problem, which is that healthcare benefits paid to pensioners had always been paid by the state year to year. But a couple of years ago, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, GASB, required that the cost of these healthcare benefits needed to be projected forward and a fund created to cover these obligations. This is new and it created a new annual cost for the state that increased the state's obligation substantially. So the upshot of all this is that the system needs to be put back in balance. That's fundamentally what the challenge is. Where does the money come from to put the system back in balance? So finally, what can we do about it? <clears throat> First, I'll say that proposals that put all or most of the responsibility on rebalancing the pension fund on public employees are non-starters. Um, that there's no way that anyone can say that state employees or pensioners created this problem uh, and that they're responsible for correcting it. On the other hand, the state is responsible for paying, for creating part of this, at least part of the problem and is responsible for correcting it. Uh, the, the, because of its failure to contribute adequately to the fund for years. Um, and so before, any, before there's any discussion about how to address the rest of the problem, um, they, the state needs to sort of step up and say, uh, you know, what they're going to do to correct for the, the, this, the impact of that failure. We don't know what that amount is, as I said earlier, but that should be one of the first things the new commission does is determine what the state's obligation is going forward to fully correct for the 15 years of underfunding. So what I can tell you is that there's no simple way out of this. As Speaker Krowinski noted, if this were simple, it would have been solved already. And that's true. But the challenge is how to rebalance the pension funds without making harmful cuts to employees' compensation. And I wanna repeat that statement from the pension committee that I cited earlier, just because I think, again, I think it articulates well, um, the, or, or it's important to sort of keep perspective on as we're solving this, what the whole point of the pension system is. And so the, the, the quote is that the commission believes that teachers are the foundation of our education system, a resource integral to the long-term viability of the Vermont economy. Retirement security is an important piece of the employment package as individuals make life decisions about their careers. Without a competitive retirement plan, schools will not be able to compete for high quality teachers. I think these words should guide the new commission and the legislature as they work to address the issue this year. So I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know if there's a chance for questions or not, but I'm happy to take those if they are, but otherwise, thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you, Paul. Um, and yeah, if folks wanna go ahead and put any questions or <clears throat> comments they have in the chat, um, we do have someone moderating them um, and we can try and address them in the chat. Um, and we do have some, a participation uh, session kind of at near near the end of the event tonight. Um, so yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, next up, we have Julie Sipple Silowash, and she is a parent and a public school supporter. Um, so take it away, Julie. Thank you so much, Jubilee. I appreciate it. Um, good evening. As Jubilee said, my name is Julie Sipple Silowash, and I've lived in Vermont for four years now public schools and therefore teachers and the state employees in general have been a huge part of my life in many ways. 
My parents were both public school teachers. I attended Pittsburgh Public Schools from kindergarten through 12th grade, and now I'm a parent to three students who range in age from preschool through sixth grade. I'm a founding member of the Parent Teacher Neighbor Organization at Northfield Elementary School, and I'm a one-to-one -one parent educator at Northfield Middle High School, and I'm a taxpayer. Um, I personally do not get a teacher pension. So why should I or anyone else care about this issue? Why do we need to support our teachers in the discussions to save the pensions that they've been promised and paid into? First of all, it's the right thing to do. A pension is a promise. The teachers have kept up their end of the deal, but as we heard earlier, through some poor choices and management, the state has not. I've had this discussion with my children about the proposal from the state and they just can't grasp it. To put, to put the majority of the onus to rectify the underfunded pension on the teachers and other state employees who did what was asked of them is more than unfair. It is more than a broken promise. It feels like a slap in the face to educators who continually go above and beyond for their students, schools, and communities. I work with teachers all day. It's my job to collaborate and support them and our students. Many work with students you know, who will complain and we don't hear thank you a whole lot. Um, teachers will never, in my opinion, be paid what they're really worth because our country values pro athletes more than they seem to value educators. And that's a shame. Teachers who have just faced 12 of the most stressful months of their careers are now facing this pension issue. Teachers and educators and state employees, right, who have put their health and their mental wellness on the line these past 12 months and who give and give and give and now their promise of a pension that they can live on, you know, after serving a reasonable amount of time is being eroded away. My second kind of point was that we need qualified teachers. We already have a teacher shortage in Vermont. Ask any teacher, ESP, sub, or building admin how hard it is to fill positions and how often they have to cover classes because we just don't have enough teachers. The proposed fix that we heard earlier and thankfully was pushed you know, aside is only gonna contribute to that pre-existing condition. Teachers are smart, y'all. They know a bad deal when they see one. <laughs> Why would qualified educators take positions in Vermont under such circumstances? And every single Vermont resident should want the best teachers in their schools. We need educators who are adaptable to students' needs and well-versed in solid teaching methods, interventions, classroom management, and PBIS. They are literally helping to educate and shape the future of community members, leaders, employers, and employees of Vermont. An investment in our teachers, in their pensions, is an investment in the future of our state. Third, our teachers show up every day for our students. We can show up for them. I'm not saying that teachers should show up at work sick or put their all in until they burn out. I'm not saying they should put their students above the needs of their families. That's not fair, it's not sustainable, and it's not in their contract, but. I have memories of my dad working with walking pneumonia because they didn't have enough subs. And so he went in. Um, one time he was injured by a student and had to get stitches and he was back at work the next day. He was always at school, um, chaperoning dances, running the scoreboards for what felt like every single sport imaginable, grading term papers. Um, he used to pay me a dime for counting the number of words on term papers because they used to be typed, right? There were no digital word counts back then. My first drawings were on the backs of extra mimeographed worksheets. You know, as we got older, I would help to read books that he wanted to put into the curriculum because when someone becomes a teacher, their family gets involved in one way or another. 
um, you know, going to homecoming or sporting events or, you know, watching them grade papers. Our educators work so hard and their families adapt to this life. And the state needs to show their gratitude and keep their promise to the teachers and to their families. My last point is kind of, so how do we show solidarity? So we're gonna be giving some action steps later, but by signing petitions, we're in red for ed on your school's local action days by emailing local teachers unions and asking how you can help them. Share info about this ongoing issue at your local PTA, PTO meetings and school board meetings. Contact your local representatives to let them know how you as an individual and maybe your parent organization feel about this issue. Show up, stand up, speak up about the raw deal that the state tried to give our teachers. Tell your neighbors about the good things that educators are doing in your community. Tell your representatives that we need equal labor representation on this task force. It's time to support your teachers and fight for their pensions the way they've been supporting and fighting for your students. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, next up, we have Neely Jennings. Uh, she is one of our member leaders with Rights and Democracy, um, and she is also a parent. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, it was so great to hear from um, Paul and Julie and um, so much of what they said resonated with me. So yeah, again, my name is Neely Jennings. Um, I live in Starksboro with my husband and two kids who are ages five and one. So um, I'm just about to embark on this journey of being a public school parent for the next 16 or so years. Um, and, you know, teachers are very dear to my heart. My mom is a retired teacher. Um, and so, yeah, I grew up with that awareness that, um, she was paid far less than my dad, even though she had a higher level of education and she was um, working just as hard as him. And, and so I could not agree more with you, Julie, that um, teachers have never been paid what they're really worth. And I hope someday they will be because they deserve it. Um, but um, yeah, and, and in the past year throughout the pandemic, I think people have really recognized that teachers are not just teaching our kids, they're playing such a big role in, in raising our kids, providing safety and care that some kids might not be getting um, elsewhere. And then also as Michelle lifted up in the chat here, um, state employees as well have really provided lots of leadership throughout the pandemic and also deserve to have their pensions um, kept in place. So, um, yeah, just hearing over the past year, first of all, that we can't even afford to keep our some of our local schools open, including um, the one in my town, and also that we can't afford to provide teachers with pensions at the level that they've been promised. Um, it's just like such a disconnect. Like now is not the time to be asking teachers to be making more sacrifices. They've already made so many, especially over the past year. Um, if anyway, if anything, we should be increasing their compensation and finding new ways to attract and retain the talented educators that we are lucky to have. Um, and we, you know, we've, because teachers are already underpaid, we're pro we've probably already lost out on some talent where people couldn't afford to or weren't willing to make um, sacrifice earnings to be teachers. So, um, so yeah, and then on a personal level, um, I, I worry that if we continue to divest from public education, that my kids' generation will be even less equipped um, to face some of the overlapping crises of climate catastrophe and political unrest and whatever other challenges are headed their way, as I'm sure they will be um, and already are. So um, I like that's just one personal way that um, investing in education is so important. Um, and as, as a parent, I'm, I'm expecting to be involved in my students and my kids' education and advocate for my values to be reflected and advocate for my kids' learning needs and all kinds of things like that. But I'd love to not have to worry that my kids' teacher might have to get a second job to make ends meet or that they'll leave for a higher paying private sector job. Um, and yeah, finally, I'm just, I'm really 
done with being told that as someone who lives in one of the wealthiest supposedly most wealthy countries in the world that we can't afford things that are actually basic human rights um whether it's health care or affordable housing or high quality child care and education um it's actually it's not true that we can't afford those things i think it's actually we can afford teacher pensions we can afford all these um things that are basic human needs. And it's it's a matter of redistributing wealth um, that's being hoarded by corporations and billionaires and, and making different decisions about how we all allocate funds. Um, and that includes at the federal level. I think we, we should be also advocating for um, funds to be distributed to states from the federal um, level, but also at the state level, how we're allocating um, resources. So there's definitely enough to go around. And I think we just need to get out of the mindset that we can't afford it. We don't have enough because we are, we are, we are we, there's plenty. We just need to, um, to distribute wealth in a more appropriate way. So thank you. I look forward to hearing from the participants too. Thank you so much, Neely. Um, next up, we have uh, fresh off the Vermont State House floor, uh, digital floor. Um, to join us is ta uh, Representative Tanya Vihovsky. She is one of Rights and Democracy's um, legislative champions um, and just an all around wonderful person. So um, you are up, Tanya. Awesome. Th Awesome. Thanks so much. I was for a moment, I worried that I was still on mute. Um, I am so happy to be here. I am um, a RAD member and have been on the leadership committee for a while and was elected to my first term in the state house. Um, just that this is my first term in the state house and I serve on the government operations committee, which is part of the reason that I'm sure you can all imagine that I'm here, given that we're talking about pensions and we're talking about how to stand in solidarity with our teachers and our parents and across our communities. And I jumped in and just caught the end of, of this, I, the idea that we do have enough. And it's interesting that that is what I jumped in on because I am on the House floor, and we are about to take on $20 million in corporate tax breaks that are being proposed when we just got done having an argument that we can't afford our pensions. And so I, you are absolutely right. It is not that we don't have the money. It's about how we allocate it and who we say is important. And so I'm really excited to be here today to really lead that a conversation in what ways we can show up as, as parents and community members in solidarity on these issues. This pension issue is important to all of us. Certainly it's our teachers and state employees that are immediately impacted by any pension cuts, but the reality is, is that it's all of us that are impacted. Our teachers and our state employees have carried us through this pandemic. They have made sure that our children and our families have food and educational materials. And in this moment, I mean, I think we need to do better for our teachers and state employees always, but certainly in this moment, it is absolutely a matter of import dire importance that we recognize the work that they do. Without high quality education and without our state workers, we can't continue to have a state that is welcoming and has high quality education. And with the proposed cuts that we have seen and the way that this is this process is moving forward, we won't be able to recruit and retain high quality teachers. And so how do you, and, and I'm, I'm gonna let you jump in either using your hand raise function, which depending on what Zoom iteration you're using is either in your participants list or under reactions, or you can throw things in the chat, but I'm really curious to hear what ways you as parents feel you can stand in, in solidarity with our teachers and across our communities on this issue? Just jump right in. Um, Representative Bajowski, this is Liz Filsko. I am a former public school teacher and I am the Vermont Renews Housing State Campaign Organizer. And I just want to remind folks that Teacher Appreciation Week is coming up. And I ask that our community members and our parents really show appreciation for our public school employees and frankly, our uh, state employees in any way you can. If you can bring donuts to a local municipal office, please do that. If you can bring handmade, you know, cookies or whatever, notes, 
notes of appreciation to your local public school for all of the staff, that sort of uh, gesture, it really goes a long way. And this is an important year that we show appreciation for our school personnel and our municipal workers. So I just wanna ask that, you know, folks listening to this conversation, get involved with your PTO, please. We, we, we are here to support and strengthen Vermont's public schools and, and show solidarity with state employees. So um, that is a way that we can show solidarity for, this is the largest block of employees in the entire state. We need to stand in solidarity. This is, this is our government. I think it's it's so important that you bring that up when I just to put this in perspective when we are talking about th who this issue impacts we are talking about the almost 20,000 teachers and state employees and the almost 50,000 retirees of those programs it's 70,000 Vermonters it's over a tenth of our population this issue and as I said it impacts all of us. It, we may not immediately see it, but it does. And I certainly didn't jump in here knowing how exactly to stand in, in solidarity, but it, it came down to listening and being present and, and simply saying, you know, I hear you and I'm going to fight with you. And that doesn't mean we win all the time. I think sometimes I, I can certainly speak to this because I felt pretty defeated yesterday when a bad bill got voted out of my committee. And I fought and I fought and I fought and I won like 0.5% of those fights. But it didn't mean it didn't matter. And that's what I heard all day yesterday. I got all of the, and this is what it means to stand in solidarity. I got calls from teachers and from people across the state saying, we see you. We know you're fighting for us. And it feels like a loss today, but you brought that to the, the stage to have the bigger conversation. And now it's like regrouping. And how do we stand up and call our representatives, our larger representatives now, because this is coming to the House floor next week and say, that's not good enough, do better. And how do we reach out to our senators and say, that's not good enough, do better. So that's one way, but I'm, I'm curious what other ways that you, or ways that you have jumped in and, and stood with our teachers in this past year. I'm sure that many of you. Well, if, if I can jump in, um, I, I, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit. I, I'm a parent, but I'm also a teacher. And I just want to <laughs> say thank you so, so much for being here on a busy night. I just like, this is just all of you, this is food for the soul. and and thank you so much. Um, we just came off of a hard week locally um, where our school board was, you know, talking about how we have, how they have to cut our pay and, and people are, you know, and in local negotiations have gone really badly. And they said, well, we either have to take a pay cut or you're going to, or we're going to cut three teaching positions. And, uh, you know, so, so we're experiencing some, some hard stuff across the state. I think the best way um, that we could, we could get support is to come to school board meetings if you can, um, because uh, because that's that's where a lot of decisions get made, and um, I, I and I don't know. I, I reach out to. Uh, I think um, you might have the best idea, um, Representative um, Fajowski, because uh, you know in terms of what how to support on the state level, but I think at the local level, coming to school board meetings and speaking in support of of uh, of of school employees is uh, is super 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 helpful. So thank you. And thank you so much for everyone for being here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's so much about coming together. And this is this is what I love about doing this work in the way that I'm doing this work. And it has really, I think, surprised a lot of people is that we are doing it in a way that says, yes, I'm on the state level, but we also have to be talking about what we're doing outside. This has been my response to people all day today is I, I'm going to fight for these things, but I'm one person, but I have so much more power if all of you are giving, are lending me your voice and fighting with me. I would love to jump in. I'm also a teacher um, as well as a parent. And um, one of the things that's helpful for me, I'm working with the pension committee that Colin Robinson is doing at the state level. And one of the things that's helpful for me is knowing a couple parents who are political activists who I can pump stuff out to and say, um, please educate parents about this. So for example, I gave them this link yesterday and said, please let people know. And that's, that's really helpful because I think education is such an important part of it. Um, 
you know, a lot of people just don't really know that this is going on, don't know things like the numbers you just gave about one tenth of the population is benefiting from the pension right now. Like that's pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, when you think about, you know, I know I, I stand to lose potentially $500,000 through some of these changes and that feels huge to me, but they won't tax people who make that amount in a year. Like that just is shocking to me. Um, I think, on, I live in Wyndham County, and I think one of the our school board is actually very supportive um, right now in terms of things like the pension. But I would love to see people really reach out to our state, state reps because they are um, not necessarily all on on the page. Some are maybe borderline and could really use some understanding of where the whole community stands. So, and thank you so much for your work and your support. I really appreciate it. It it means a lot. Yeah. And when, thank you for, again, carrying us through in the way that you have, and you're so right. You know, one of the things we heard when we brought the amendment to the floor to tax the, the top, you know, the marginal tax over 500,000 was that the people don't support this, but you can prove them wrong. The people do support this. Julie. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I know that I've contacted some of my local, local representatives, and are there any other specific representatives that we should make sure that we're emailing or calling to make sure that our voices are being heard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously you tend to have the most sway with your individual representatives. And I would certainly reach out, you know, at what we know is the pathway forward for this bill is that it passed out of house government ops on a vote of nine to two. Um, it is going to house appropriations because it does carry an appropriation and then it should come to the house floor early next week. Um, it will, so you could certainly reach out to the appropriations committee and let them know that you still have concerns with this bill. I don't know that that's the, the best use of your energy right now. What I actually think is the best use of your energy is to reach out to your senators and to reach out to the Senate government operations committee because that's where this bill goes after that. And honestly, I think, I think the Senate government operations committee, I've been in contact with them pretty regularly along the way is probably a friendlier place for this to get to move in a different direction, but they need to hear from you. I will be I will be meeting with Senate government operations in the next few days and have been along the way to really sort of let them know here are our concerns. And we will possibly be bringing some amendments to the floor next week. We're sort of looking at what, what makes the most sense and where we sort of get the most traction. So you may have reached out to your representative before it made it out of government operations, but sort of paying attention, like, are there amendments that I need that I now want to say, I want you to support this. Um, it's, it's a hard to follow process. I will tell you that over the last week or so, I've spent a lot of time on the phone with people who don't understand the process and who are feeling frustrated and some of them even apologizing to me for, for me having to explain the process to them. But that to me, A, it's my job. And B, it speaks to just how disconnected we've gotten as people to our supposed representative democracy. So if you know someone in your community that wants to engage more, connect with them, ask, you know, support them to engage more. There's so many ways that we can do this. I'm looking at a, did I answer your question? Okay, perfect. So I'm looking at a question in the chat and um, the person, William, if you wanna ask your question, you're more than welcome to, but I'm also happy to um, jump in and read it and answer it that way. It's totally up to you and what you feel most comfortable with. All right, so I will answer your question. So what it, um, what it says is really thinking about what has the most impact on other representatives. Um, I think phone calls and handwritten letters are generally more powerful than form emails. Um, not that a form email doesn't matter because that volume does matter, but if you have the time to make a quick phone call and leave a message or write a, write a handwritten letter, that is, I think, carries some more weight. Um, I think really, I think you can absolutely state that this is a deal breaker issue for you. And if you truly aren't going to support their reelection, reach it, go into your communities and start looking for who you're going to recruit to replace them. Um, and yes, campaign, do, you know, I think particularly with grassroots candidates. So I ran as a grassroots candidate that didn't accept corporate donations, didn't accept business donations. So every little donation made a huge difference. So if you're going into your community and saying, I want to recruit someone to run that's going to do this kind of co-governance, that's going to work with us, in all likelihood, they won't accept corporate donations. So even if you can afford $5, every little bit goes a long way. 
Um, so I think all of those things are important. I think when you're asking for your representative's help is probably not the time to threaten them. Um, so if you're wanting to th their help, that may be the time to just say, you know, I really want your help and this is a really important issue to me. Um, here are the things I would like you to do. When they don't, that is the time to say, okay, so I see you don't support me, which means I probably can't support you. I'm gonna you know, go out and, and recruit someone else. But I definitely think that it is important when you're specifically asking for them to support an issue you stand for, that that is not the time to say, if you don't do this, um, not, and that doesn't mean that that's not true. I just generally, my experience, and, and I work as a, so, a school social worker when I'm not in the legislature. Um, so I do, I, I find generally speaking, you get, you know, what is that saying? You get more flies with honey than vinegar. And it doesn't mean you're not actively recruiting their replacement because we need more regular people. In, in our legislature and not, you know, rich retirees or, you know, the people who just are so disconnected from these real issues. I hope that that answered your, your question. Any other thoughts or things people want to throw in about how we, that, or things I can answer about how we. Anya, there is a question from Alice Leeds. I missed um, that. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so I, I would agree with you that this is one piece that has really not been talked about enough in the grand scheme of things. So as many people know, for decades, the pensions were underfunded. And in fact, teachers have already shifted and changed. You know, we, we went to the rule of 90 and then we raised contribution rates. So already teachers are working longer because it was just 10 years ago that we sort of readjusted everything and teachers compromised a lot. And then they compromised on healthcare. And now we're back at the table saying, we want you to pay more and work longer. And while the state has earmarked about $150 million in one-time funds to pay down some of that unfunded liability, it's a drop in the bucket. It. And they're unwilling to acknowledge the compounding effect of nearly two decades of underfunding. It's absolutely just, it's not acceptable. There is no other way around it. And from the, in the vast majority of conversations I've had, I have found that our state workers and our teachers are so willing to come to the table and our state go and say, how do we fix this? And what do we do? And our state government has so frequently said, like, just no, like we're going to do this our way. We're going to give you the plan and you're just going to do it. And that is unacceptable. There's no other word for it. It's just completely unacceptable. Um, one of the things that I was, a, one of that little 0.5% that I was able to get included in the bill that was voted out of committee is that the task for, one of the tasks of the task force is to identify both short and long-term funding streams. The short-term to help pay down some of that underfunding impact and the long-term to ensure that it never happens again. You know, it, the argument came up in committee that we, you know, we have the ADEC and we do have, we are dedicated to funding that. And I pushed back and I said, frankly, from from what we've seen in history, that's simply not true because we didn't fund it for two, for nearly two decades. And without an earmarked fund that says this is for the pensions, that can happen again. So that was a, a small win is that that is now included in the task force charges is to identify revenue streams for the short and long term. Um, so, I mean, again, it's not being acknowledged enough. And I know that it is a really important piece. And I'm, I'm glad that we got that little win. Did I miss anything else in the chat? <laughs> oh, Carmen, that's my mom's name, by the way. <laughs> oh, nice, great name. I agree. <laughs> Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for your support and thank you for coming to this meeting. And I am a Vermont Talks Fair, but I'm also a teacher. And one of the things that I'm wondering about, which actually two things that I really don't feel have been addressed, and I was wondering if you would be able to either shed more light or bring this back to look at how we can sort of display this to try to, you know, come to the table with some problems solving ideas. And that is one, we really wondering when the projected time will be that uh, this fund will be would be considered insolvent if nothing were to change as is to, to look at our timeline. And then the other piece, um, looking at um, how to, I think, um, I forget who spoke before, um, that said it really well that how are we going to really address 
the deficit before we move on with the new plan of continuing to fund it. Is that? Yeah, and that is you can shed more light. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Go. That's why I earmarked two funding streams, both a short and a long term. Um, and I wish I knew the answer to your question about the timeline. I asked the treasurer repeatedly to give me a, you know, do you have a projected date that the fund will be insolvent? Um, and she didn't ever give me a real answer. Um, what I do know is that we have over $5 billion in liquid assets in the pension trusts, and we don't pay out anywhere near that. And she did, she did affirm that it is not going to be insolvent in the next year. It is not going to be insolvent in the next two years. And part of the reason that the unfunded liability ballooned as much as it did is because we adjusted the actuarial rate of return. And there is some belief that we went too low. The, the recommendation was actually that we go to 7.15%, but it was adjusted down to seven. So that number being adjusted actually changes the actuarial rate of return projection, because it's a projection. This unfunded liability is not actually, we owe this much. It is this projection of what we might owe based on how the stock market does do. So it's, it's kind of a messy piece, but the fund is not immediately in danger of going insolvent. And we are, we presently can pay out everything that we need to pay out. Do we need to be more careful about our investments? Absolutely. It's one of the reasons I've, I've continued to call for a full audit of the pension. Where are we investing? How are we investing? What are the fees? Because I think we need that information to carry forward in a responsible way. The other piece of information I'll leave you with, because I've actually, I'm seeing that I have a roll call vote coming up. So I've got to run back to the floor is that in the history of public pensions, one has ever gone bankrupt, and that was in Decatur, Alabama. So we're not, this is not a, a precedent that there is. It's one of, you know, when I was questioning the business roundtable, it's one of the things I brought up with them because they kept re referring it to it as a business thing. But this is a public pension. It's a different animal. And states don't go bankrupt. Like we will find a way. So it's not, it's been framed as a crisis. It's a problem, but it is not an immediate crisis. I appreciate your answer and I just have one other quick question and that is how can we help support you and other representatives in sort of pushing for the treasurer to give this information? I mean, reach out to her in her office. You know, I think you could also reach out to the auditor and ask the auditor to do that audit. And he's willing. He's just really mm -hmm. looking for the appropriation. And, you know, but I, and, and reaching out again to your representatives and your senators saying, we want this. We want to know. We, we believe in transparency and other states have done it. California has done it. In Kentucky, they did this kind of full spectrum audit and discovered all kinds of horrible private hedge fund investments that were paying fees that they never saw back. So it, there is precedent. Yeah. Thank you so much for your support. Absolutely. And thank you all for all the work you're doing for all of our communities. And if you have more questions, Liz and Jubilee have my contact information and you can feel free to reach out to me anytime. Have Thank a great you. rest of your meeting. I'm going to jump back to the floor. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, yes, that was wonderful. We're always happy to have Tanya join us. Um, so now we are going to, um, a couple folks asked about things they could do. Um, so right now, tonight, we are all going to do, take some action together. Um, so if you look in the chat, um, a link should get posted. I want, there we go. Um, so I'm just going to ask all of you to click on this um, link with me right now. I'm sorry, I am looking at my internet, so I'm not looking at all of you. Um, so we want to tell our legislators that no pension cuts for Vermont educators and state employees. Um, we're going to ask them to deliver on their pension promises. Um, and that you know, we've just gone through probably one of the most difficult times in our um, points of our lifetimes. Um, and our teachers and our state employees have been serving our communities throughout it all. Um, so um, I'm gonna ask you to scroll down and fill in your information.
and it should auto generate um, the people um, in your area who you should be sending this information to. Um, the ones who need to hear it. For me, it is Phil Scott, our governor, and then my local senators, Chris Bray and Ruth Hardy, um, and then my current state rep, Harvey Smith. Um, and so it auto generates. You don't even need to write a subject line, a personal message, though we always, like Tanya mentioned, it's always great if you can put your own spin. But, you know, if you're new at this, not sure what to say, um, it's there right for you. And so you just go through, through it, um, and then you hit send message. And so once that is done, we ask you share this, share it out with your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, share it on your social media. Um, this is a really easy way that our community can reach out and show our support and show our legislators that we're paying attention. Um, and this is what we want. We support our teachers, we support our school staff, um, and and we support our state employees. You know, um, some of some of states' um, wonderful state employees have been on this call this evening. Um, I just want to give some background. This event kind of has come out from uh, parent organizing we've been doing around supporting and saving our community schools. So I know it feels very teacher heavy, but know that we see you and we support you um, and we are behind you as well. Um, you know, it's, you can't separate out this issue. It, it affects so many. Um, and we support teachers pensions, we support school staff pensions, and we support our state employees. Um, so we are almost done for the evening. I do want to have this event was um, democracy. I am the Vermont co-chair of the C4 board. Um, there's kind of two wings of rights, rights and democracy. C3 work allows us to do this community organizing and education so that we can build a broad base of support uh, around the issues that affect us and that are important to us and our shared collective. Um, so if you would like to support this work, you can make a contribution to the Rights and Democracy Institute um, and that link will get posted in the chat. We also have our C4 uh, C4 wing, um, and that work pays for us to lobby our legislators as well as train the next generation of all levels of governmental leaders um, to make the decisions that support our shared values and that uphold and advance the good of our whole order. Um, so I hope you will please support our C4 work by making a contribution to the Rights and Democracy Project. And that link will also get posted in the chat. So support one, support both, um, and make sure you uh, check us out on social media. Um, we are on Facebook and we are on Twitter, um, our website, um, is in both of those links um, and be sure to share us out. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, and have a wonderful night.